On this episode of Law Weekly, we talk about the recently concluded primaries of the different political parties, issues of monetization of delegates, what role law can play in guiding the electoral process, as well as how to insulate judicial officers from undue political interference. My guest is a senior legal practitioner, Wahab Shitsu. Also showing on the program, the Nigerian Bar Association holds its National Executive Council neck meeting in Ilori, Kwara State. Plus our recap of some of the top trending legal stories. Hello and welcome to the program. I am Shola Shueli. In line with the guidelines from the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, all political parties in the country have concluded their primaries. And this is the starting point of my conversation with a senior legal practitioner, Mr. Wahab Shitu. I began by asking his assessment of the whole process. In terms of transparency of the process, open transparency of the process, I must commend the political parties across the divide. Uh, the voting was done transparently in the full glare of everyone. The counting and the sorting of votes were, were also carried out publicly in the full glare of both the local and international community. And uh, uh, so in terms of transparency of the process, I want to score the political parties very, very highly. But in terms of what transpired behind the scenes and what appears obvious to the designing public, I feel very sad for this country. Sad for this country in the sense that democracy is supposed to be the expression of the popular will, freely donated by the people, devoid of inducement devoid of uh, enticement and devoid of uh, corrupt practices. But what we have seen clearly, and which is something that can be confirmed by participants in the process, uh, including the electorate, is that uh, the process is, has been, uh, was heavily, emphasis, heavily monetized. Which gives the impression that what we practice is not true democracy. What we practice appears to me to be cash and carry democracy. Yes, yeah, somebody might be with a very deep pocket. Any fool can make money. But the person might be lacking or in terms of ideas. And what, and what, uh, what drives every country forward is the quality of ideas. Uh, not necessarily how deep your pocket is. To that extent, I feel very sad that the entire democratic space has been heavily monetized, thereby giving the impression that if you don't have money, you don't have anything to offer. And for an imagined democracy like ours, or somewhat growing democracy, that is very sad. What I also see playing out is what I can call conspiracy of the elite. Except you, you have heavy connections with the people that matters. You are not likely to be reckoned with. But you know that this country is a country of highly talented people across the, all geopolitical zones. People are gifted in terms of human resource capacity. This country is blessed. So we have people who can move the process forward by the power of ideas who are denied the opportunity of making quality contributions. To that extent, I feel very sad. And I think we should, uh, now purchasing even nomination forms at the cost of 100 million, 50 million is absurd. You want to, you, you, you want to find out, that you, you want to imagine how people come across us or among us amount and what they are likely to do if eventually they are entrusted with power. And also, I'm impressed by the number of people who have also come out. The co most of the candidates who, have come, who came out from all, across the parties are, in my view, quality people. Uh, for instance, APC, you have up to 23 candidates. Many of them are accomplished people who have made names either 
uh, who have uh, you know impeccable public service record. And the fact that they, as many of them came forward shows that uh, we don't want to uh, enthrone you know a regime of uh, the tyranny of the minority. So a lot of people come forward. It shows that awareness is becoming more higher, and that people are willing to participate in the process. The other issue that gives me concern is that this is a country of about 80 million people. You don't just say about 2,000 delegates will come and decide for the rest of us. You need to widen the democratic space. As, uh, as many people as possible who are quality driven, who understand the issues, should have been allowed to participate in the process. Now, if you now restrict the participation to a few delegates, there is a danger and the reality of manipulation of these delegates uh, who, who could have some other considerations in mind other than considerations of uh, uh, national interest in deploying their votes. We know there are a lot of hunger, a lot of poverty, a lot of uh, illiteracy in and around our country. And uh, this is, people can, on account of those you know, limitations, cast their votes. And those limitations might not necessarily reflect national interest. The delegate system is open to manipulation. It's too restrictive. I, that is why I also believe that uh, statutory delegates ought to have been accorded the right to participate because already they are elected by virtue of Section 223, which says that uh, the, uh, the people who are elected through democratic process should be given opportunity to participate. So if you exclude them, you also limit the number and it does not, it's not in the interest of our country. And I'm saying this with all sense of seriousness, going by the definition of democracy. Democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people. And it's also a question of number. I want to touch on some of the sore issues that you talked about. The issue of a few delegates um, deciding Nigerians, the monetization of the process as you've rightly identified. Is there any role that law can play or how can we amend the various laws for a reform of the process? Is it tinkering with the electoral act or what do you propose? It requires all of those elements you have mentioned. It requires a, a, a holistic amendment of our electoral laws. It also requires a, a, um, reform, like you have, you have mentioned. Law is a very powerful tool, particularly in the democratic process. If we have in mind the meaning of democracy and the need to ensure popular participation, if that is the objective that we seek to achieve, law then can then be deployed as a tool to achieve those objectives. We can, as much as possible, I'm in favor of an arrangement that will widen our democratic space that will ensure that as many people as possible have opportunity of deciding who to govern them. And that's what democracy is about. You should widen the democratic space, first of all. Again, you should ensure that no one is disenfranchised or excluded from the po political process or the, the, the democratic you know, engagement process. That is what democracy is saying. They are saying that, oh, it, it doesn't mean that you, you, you can then dictate to the people who to elect. No. If they choose to elect a devil, that is their own choice. But you don't deprive the people the opportunity of making that choice. Choice is critical to a democratic you know, process. And as many people as possible should be allowed to make that choice. If you now exclude them, either by legislation, or by some whims and caprices, or by deploying some other mechanisms other that, that will influence the, the exercise of the rights of popular will, then you are endangering the system. Democracy is endangered. There are a lot of factors that can cool and endanger democracy. One of them is cash and carry democracy that I've mentioned. The other one is democracy of AK-47. When you deploy violence, and scare people away from the democratic process, either by assassination or, you know, 
uh, unlawful use of firearms or violent autogri, you are also, in a way, preventing democracy from taking root. The other issue is that if you anoint people, democracy of anointing, oh, this is the person that we have anointed, this is the pe so all of you must kill behind the person and then vote. It, that's an imposition. And uh, we should allow people freely to exercise their will to, as to the people they want to govern them. So if those people fail to discharge, they also have the right to vote them out. So the, in a democracy, the, the power of your vote is very critical. And that power must not be influenced by any extraneous considerations. It must not be induced by any extraneous consideration. You must, you, may, you must not be blackmailed, or neither should you be intimidated in, 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 in exercising your right. That would derogate from democratic tradition. Democracy must ensure the rule of law prevails. It must ensure the, uh, the primacy of fundamental rights. It must ensure that there is zero tolerance for corruption. It must also be based on adherence to due process. Transparency and accountability. That's what we do call democracy. Any other issue that derogates from those established principles negates the, the democratic tradition and ought to be discouraged. Because we, we elect freely that want to practice democracy. We should be seen in, in, in spirit and in letters and practice as practicing it. Otherwise, we will we'll be telling a lie about what we are doing. Some people argue that money politics is very endemic and it's cultural. So do you really see law being able to effect any change in that area? Well, law can. Some of these uh, vices that we talk about, heavy monetization of the process, criminalities in the political process, they, they exist and they grow and mature. Because we don't have a regime of consequences for criminal infractions. If we do a lot a, a close monitoring and people are brought to book. Because when you induce people with money, the way we see around, you are indirectly endangering our future. The, the funds you are talking about can be deployed in, in, into the developmental process to provide schools, provide education, provide good roles, provide jobs opportunities. Those are legacies that will leave all of us. Not to start using it, because once you spend heavy, heavy money like that, you are likely to think of ways of recouping those monies. And, I, I, and this will be at the expense of the people. So law can introduce a, and sustain and enforce a regime of consequences for criminal infractions. People spend, people that you, you need also to interrogate and investigate the sources of some of this funding. People are not brought to book. So that is the, the, the rule of law regime will take care of some of these uh, difficulties. A, a democracy is founded principally on rule of law. We must insist that law must prevail. Our judiciary must be strengthened enhanced, monitored, and made to be effective and efficient. People have said it, I've heard it, that if you want to take care of any any country, address two critical areas, the police and the judiciary. Once you take care of the police and the judiciary, and that area is uh, has zero tolerance for corruption, the, the problems of our country has to do with lack of respect for law and order. Once law and order is, is enthroned as a creed, when there is primacy of law and order in any country, that country will develop. All other things come. Now, it seems that you've preempted my final question, which is that attention would now rightly shift to the judiciary with the conclusion of the primaries. And lawyers such as yourself will fi file all kinds of applications, all kinds of motions, some even to model up the process. But what can be done to check the desperation of politicians and to insulate our judiciary from the political excesses? I think the best the judiciary can do for itself is to embark upon self-cleansing. 
Because the judiciary is too important an organ to be rubbish or ridiculed by anybody. Everybody looks forward, looks up to the judiciary. The, co the judiciary is seen as the last hope of the common man. So, and being the last hope of the common man, we should look inward and ensure that we live above board. Our judicial officers at all levels must be protected, yes, must not be allowed to be harassed, but, but also we must in, in, put in place a, an internal control mechanism that will punish those who run foul of ethics. Even lawyers who take on, uh, who, who take on frivolous briefs or who, who, who come to court with frivolous applications ought to be sanctioned because we have, you know, the, our rules of professional ethics are there. The, the, uh, you know what to do as a lawyer and what not to do as a lawyer. You know, but uh, we should not allow such rules to just be very you know, good on paper. We should implement them. The Nigerian Bar Association has concluded its National Executive Council neck meeting in Ilori, Kwara State. And we have some of the highlights of the key decisions taken at that meeting in this next report. A minute of silence in honor of Nigerians who lost their lives in insecurity attacks across the country. May the souls of our departed compatriots rest in perfect peace. The NBA uses the opportunity of its meeting to task government to step up efforts geared at finding lasting solutions to the rising incidents of insecurity across the country. You just have to ask yourself, when do we get a reprieve from bad news in Nigeria? This body must not shy away from continually holding government at all levels, governments at all levels, to task to ensure that they step up and carry out their primary responsibility, which is to safeguard the lives and properties of Nigerians. This is all the more imperative as we approach another election season that characteristically witnesses a spike in insecurity challenges. The meeting also dwelt on issues of the profession, especially the fast approaching 2022 NBA election. Talking about the forthcoming NBA elections, it is coming at a critical period in the development of our association. And we therefore have a duty to ask questions of those seeking various offices. Will the 2022 elections signify a return to the old ways of doing things or are we going to embrace candidates in the different offices who can consolidate on our achievements or represent the progress that we need? It is up to you, the electorate, to decide. The NBA elections are scheduled to be conducted by electronic voting, commencing from 00 hours to 23.59 hours on July the 16th, 2022. Kano State in Nigeria's northwest region has launched its sexual offender database to check the rising trend of the offense. Here's the report. Kano State is reported to have about 700 cases of different forms of sexual assaults on a monthly basis. This trend has become worrisome as it is becoming rather rampant. There is also difficulty to track offenders, particularly for the protection of women and children in the state. This has, however, informed the launching of Kano State's Sexual Offender Database. The event, held at the Ministry of Justice High Court Conference Hall in Kano, has in attendance the Chief Judge High Court of Justice, Nora Segura, government officials, security agencies, and civil society groups. The host of the launch, Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice, says it has become pertinent to take steps to curb the menace in the state. As it is now, their records are not kept, so they have the, they, they have the opportunity of committing an offence from this one area and move to another area, or from one local government to another local government, which is really very bad at this time. Uh, 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 at this uh, time when we have a lot of uh, things we can do to prevent that. So of course this uh, sexual offender database is going to do a lot by capturing their data and then by, you heard what the uh, Chief Judge said, uh, even pasting it at various local governments and at various centers is really going to help to shame them, to expose them they are within us, they are within the society. Uh, if we are able to expose them, 
it will, it will prevent them from committing the offense and it will protect our children. All stakeholders at the event describe the launch of the step in the right direction for the protection of women and children in the state. And just before we go, a quick recap of some of the top trending legal stories in the news. We begin with the report that the National Assembly has asked the National Industrial Court Abuja to allow an out-of-court settlement in a suit instituted against it and three others challenging poor salaries of judicial officers in the country. Counsel to the National Assembly told Justice Osatoame Obaseki Osagi that the institution is interested in an out-of-court settlement because of the nature of the matter. The counsel asked the court to grant an adjournment so as to enable parties in the matter sit and discuss on an amicable resolution. In a short ruling, Justice Obaseki Usagi adjourned the matter to June the 22nd for report of settlement by the parties in the matter. Okay, sir. Senior advocate of Nigeria, Sebastian Hon, who instituted the case, is asking the court to compel the defendants to increase salaries and allowances of judges in the country. Take out the in other news, the Court of Appeal in Abuja has issued an order restraining the National Assembly from imposing statutory delegates at the National Convention of the All Progressives Congress. In a ruling delivered by Justice Haruna Samani, also restrained the enforcement of the judgment of a federal high court in Kano, delivered on June the 3rd. In that judgment, Justice Liman, sitting in the Kano division of the court, had held that statutory delegates can participate in primaries of political parties in accordance with the Nigerian constitution. But the Court of Appeal restrained all the respondents from relying on that judgment or doing anything inconsistent with the rights of the applicant with respect to organizing, conducting the convention of the APC in, in any manner the party may deem fit to do, pending the determination of the suit seeking a stay of execution of the judgment of June the 3rd. In Ondo, the state high court sitting in Akure has sentenced three persons to death by hanging for the murder of Mrs. Funke Olakunri, daughter of the Afeni Ferry leader, Chief Ruben Fashoroti. The deceased was killed in June 2019 along the Benin Ore Shagamo Expressway in the Ore Odibo local government area of the state while on her way to Lagos. Justice William Olamide found the trial guilty of involvement in murder kidnapping and armed robbery, and sentenced them to death accordingly. A fourth suspect, Awala Abubakar, who is the spokesman of Mieti Allah, was however acquitted and discharged by the court. In Lagos, the Domestic Violence and Sexual Offences Court sitting in Ikeja has fixed July the 14th for judgment in the alleged sexual assault charge against Nollywood actor Olanre Waju Omiyinka, popularly known as Babai Jesha. Babai Jesha was arraigned before the court by the Lagos State Government on a six-count charge of indecent treatment of a child, defilement of a child, sexual assault by penetration, attempted sexual assault by penetration, and sexual assault. He had pleaded not guilty to the charge. At the last sitting of the court, the Defense Council, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Dada Wushika, asked the court not to ascribe any importance to the CCTV footage tendered by the prosecution. He asked the court to dismiss and reject the evidence on the grounds that it had been tampered with. The Lagos State Director of Prosecution, Dr. Babajiri Martins, on his part, told the court that the testimonies of the seven prosecution witnesses cannot be thrown away. He also urged the courts to accept the testimonies of the experts who gave their best to help resolve the case. After listening to parties adopt their final written addresses, Justice Uluwatoi Taiwo adjourned the matter for judgment. And we round off with the report that the federal civil service pensioners from the Lagos branch have staged a peaceful protest outside the gate of the High Court sitting at the Tafaba Lewa Square on Lagos Island. 
carrying different placards bearing their demands. The civil servants demanded the payment of the outstanding arrears on their pension. They accused the Executive Secretary of the Pension Transitional Arrangements Directorate, PTED, Dr. Choma Ejikeme, of holding on to the payment and invited the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, to beam its searchlight into the affairs of her directorate. They also asked the President to intervene and make the leadership of the country account for the money it has collected. And that's the program this week. Don't forget that you can watch again this episode of the program and past ones on our YouTube page. I'm Shola Shieli. Thank you for watching.